Do you have images with low-level detail in the deep shadows that needs to be lifted up? There's a bunch of different modules you could use in Darktable, and in this video, we're going to look at the module called Fill Light. Let's do it. Hi, and welcome to episode 37 of Understanding Darktable. As you will very quickly realize, I've decided to give up on the idea of the teleprompter. I'll explain why later. Right now, we're going to look at the Fill Light module. Now, I have to confess, I'm not a massive fan of this module. I've only used it in the process of getting ready to record this video. It's not something I am ever likely to use because I think you can get better results through the tone curve or through the zone system module. But what I've got here is an image of the lovely Taylor. This was shot on a shoot that I put together a couple of years ago. The idea was to shoot film noir, uh, and although I shot raw and therefore had color info, the intent was that these would always be monochrome or black and white images. And I thought the film noir shoot was a great candidate for this particular video because this fill light module is all about lifting shadows up out of obscurity. Now, I don't have a lot of massively deep shadows in this, but I thought it was a decent image to work with. As you can see from the history stack, all I've done is applied a, a bit of a crop from what I shot in camera, and I've used the Color Zones module to convert it to a black and white image. Now, our fill light module is very simple. It just has three controls, an exposure slider, this luminosity bar with a color picker and a width control and essentially what happens is you choose which part of the shadows you want to lift up if you wanted more detail in a certain part of the shadows you would take the eyedropper and say well okay her her skirt and her jacket here are quite dark and maybe I want to lift those up so I'll just drop the color picker there then it is a simple case of moving this little white triangle to where that marker has been placed on the luminosity bar. So we bring that up to there to say those are the shadows we want to target. Then the exposure control, as you would imagine, is expressed in f-stops and it's how much of an exposure lift do you want to apply to these particular shadows. So I'm thinking, let's just start it at half a stop, 0.5, okay? Then the width control is a Gaussian blur, essentially, that is spread over a certain number of f-stops. So if we set this to a width of 2, it means affect all of the shadows which are one stop brighter than the targeted area, as well as the shadows which are one stop darker than the targeted area. If we set that to three, then we're saying affect all of the tones one and a half stops brighter and one and a half stops darker than this point that we've marked on the luminosity bar. For that reason, I feel like this width control is way, way wider than it really should be. Because honestly, if you're setting this at anything more than four, you're just going to do weird things to your image. You really are. As an example, let's, let's just set this at five stops or five and a half stops, whatever. It doesn't matter. You'll see that very quickly your image can get really washed out. Look at a face. Like, yeah, okay, we've lifted the, the skirt and the jacket up out of the really deep, dark shadows, but what the hell happened to her face? So I personally think, you know, this width control should never be any higher than about three in my book, if you're using the module at all. Uh, like I said, I'm not really a fan of it. Obviously, at one and a third stops, this is way, way too much. And you can actually watch the histogram and you can see the, the shadows being affected as you increase this exposure slider. You can see that peak that slowly moves upwards and then stretches a little wider. But by that stage, your image looks like absolute crap. So, 
Yeah, I personally, I'm of the opinion that you are much better served by the tone curve module or the zone system module. But for those that want to use it, that's how the fill light module works. Okay, a couple of things that came in via... Oh, before that, I should thank, once again, my Patreon supporters. There's not only a small handful of you, but for those that have supported me, thank you very much. Uh, a couple of things that came in via YouTube. From sfink16. One of the suggestions in the Q&A to sharpen images to use high pass, which I agree can work well. However, Darktable does offer a hidden smart sharpen technique that you may want to look at as well. For example, I have an image of a bald eagle flying in a light blue sky background. I can eliminate sharpening the sky by adjusting the radius and threshold by only sharpening the eagle's feathers in the following manner. Use the Sharpen module, go to the Blend mode, Uniform, and select Difference to see only the detail lines of the image with no colors whatsoever. Now you can adjust Radius and Threshold to sharpen exactly the lines you want to sharpen. After you settle on the Smart Sharpening lines, you can go back to Normal mode or turn off Uniformity altogether and wind up with a Smart Sharpened image. I found out about this technique in another piece of software called Light Zone and decided to try it in Darktable. I was happy to report that it works fine. Also. Why don't any of the Darktable bloggers discuss or use the raw black and white point module? Should we use this module before we use exposure for at least setting the white point? After all, it's always the first Darktable active module, even before white balance. The manual isn't very helpful in describing this feature. Well, Sphinx 16, I haven't looked at that module recently and it's been a while since I read that particular paragraph in the user manual. As I recall, there were something like a white point slider and three different black point sliders for some bizarre reason. But I do remember the manual saying you really should never need to tweak those values. So... I, I, I don't know the answer to your question. I'm sorry. If anyone who you know is involved in the development of dark table is watching this and can shed some light on this for sphinx 16 please sing out in the comments i'm pretty sure that comment was on the high pass low pass episode yeah sorry i can't offer any more uh insight into that one for you uh, the other thing that came in was from yano palik who said hey bruce the orton effect and again this was related to the low pass module uh, and he he said he was using the low pass module to create the orton effect and i said what's the orton effect i wasn't fam familiar with it he said the orton effect is a photo enhancing method that brings an ethereal glow to the image it's heavily used in landscape photography here's a quick video explaining an easy way to achieve this look in photoshop there are also other ways to achieve a similar look but they tend to be more complicated also in Photoshop, it seems impossible to dial in the amount of blur and contrast after the layers have been changed. That's why I'm so excited about Darktable and the Low Pass tool. With Low Pass, you can adjust blur, contrast and brightness even after the effect is applied. Hope this answers the question. Looking forward to your next video. Well, Yano, thank you very much for the insight. Uh, I had a look and again, it's not really my cup of tea, but hey, if other people like that look, then uh, follow Yano's suggestion. I'll, if I remember, I will put the link to the video that Yano mentioned in the description of this video. So if you want to uh, click through and have a look at that, or I could put one of those little video link cards, whichever side it is. Uh, I've never actually tried to do one of those. So if I can work out how to link to that video, I'll put one of those little cards up in the corner uh, so you can check out the video that Yano was referring to. Okay, the teleprompter. Why did I give up on that? Well, it was way more convoluted than you would imagine. It was ridiculously complicated. At the moment, I have 
a tower of four old C- CDR spindles, you know, the, the little, you know, the round tubs that hold 50 CD spindles. So I've got four of them stacked one on top of each other and my little tripod that my cell phone is mounted in balanced on top. I'll show you the teleprompter again because you only saw it one time. So this was what I built, right? Just a simple wooden box with these little frames at 45 degrees holding this little piece of glass, which is about, oh, I think it's like a 15 by 10 standard photo size. Uh, it actually came out of a photo frame uh, mounted in there. And what I used to do was put my other cell phone across the bottom here, and that would display the text on the glass, and I'd read it off the glass. The problem was I couldn't build this any wider because of the size of the piece of glass. And when I sat it up here, I found that I was getting the sides of the teleprompter in the shot because it was just too narrow for the wide angle lens that's on the cell phone, unless I could get it pushed right back. And in order to do that, I had to balance a 12 inch by 12 inch book on top of this tower uh, so that there was somewhere for the teleprompter to sit. And then there was the extra issue of the fact that when you're recording video on this cell phone, which is an old Oppo phone, you can't turn the screen off and have the video keep recording. And so what that meant was when I'm trying to look through here and read my text off the glass, I'm seeing my face and everything going on on the video coming through the glass as well, which made it difficult to read the text. So to combat that, I got a piece of cardboard and I cut that little slot in it to go over the little piece of the clip that holds the cell phone in the tripod mount <laughs> and that would go over the cell phone and block the screen while still allowing the video to record and that was kind of okay because it made it easier to read the teleprompter but the problem was that once or twice I ended up with this edge of the cardboard actually in the field of view of the camera and because this was blocking the screen, I couldn't see that at the time of recording, and so I'd have to then crop the video when I came to produce the video. Like I said, way more complicated than it should have been. Uh, so hence why I've decided it's just not worth the effort. YouTube does a pretty good job of auto-generating the subtitle, or sorry, not subtitles, but closed captions, if you like, much the same thing, really. So I will probably just allow YouTube to do its thing, generate the closed captions based on my dialogue, and you can use that auto-translate feature that's built into YouTube if you need the closed captions to be in some other language. If anyone is finding that that system isn't working for them, let me know, but hopefully it does. All right, I think that will do it for this one, guys. Thanks again for the supporters on Patreon, and... Thank you to everyone on YouTube for all your continued comments and likes and support of what I'm doing. Much appreciated, and I'll catch you in the next one.